Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very cool to have this exhibit. It's very exciting to think about the work of screenwriters as something that's culturally of value to us. That obviously interests me because that's what I work on here at the university. So I'm really excited to be talking about this. And when you think about adaptations, as I um, talked to Patricia, I said, well, we're going to talk about a slew of different film adaptations across time, why changes that were made were made. And of course, we're going to talk about several, so we're, you know, we're going to hit on them all a little bit. Then I have some stuff up front if you want to look at them later. Obviously, some books that have been turned into films, as well as recently at the very end, we'll chat about The Martian and a small, one of the small changes they made to that, which has a big big ripple effect and I think that's a problem when people don't look at the books first or at least afterwards. When I was a kid you saw the movie and then you went to the library and you got the book and that was how you got the rest of the story and I think that was really the plan and I hope that people today use movies in that way to expand the information and the introduction to the book. So how did I get interested in this? Well look at that. When I was a kid this was a big book in little kids libraries. The Trap Family Singers, right? And everybody knows this book got turned into what? First, the play, The Sound of Music. So adaptations can come from books. They can come from theater. We'll even see a cute little thing later on. It's like, how did they do that? So first, they took this true life story. So often, obviously, an adaptation comes from a true life story. And they turned it into a theatrical event, a musical starring Mary Martin. Never got the chance to see that. I wasn't born yet. But, of course, it turned into the movie that everybody in the world has seen a million times and you've gone to the Hollywood Bowl and you've done the sing-along and it's become this, this popular culture thing. However, when I saw this movie as a kid, what struck me was, and everyone generally knows the story of Sound of Music, right? I don't have to go over it, but it's the family that escapes when the Nazis take over Austria. And at the end of the movie, they're going to perform at a big cultural festival and it's the night they escape instead. And they've left their manager to say, here they are and they don't show up and you know oh the Nazis are going to be very angry at this guy so I was very worried about their manager Max Detweiler right I'm watching this movie and I'm thinking what happened to him did the Nazis kill him I must know but the movie didn't tell me so I went to the encyclopedia because that was where I figured all the information of the world existed and I was like what nine or ten so I look in the encyclopedia and his name doesn't show up and thinking, well, clearly he's a really important man. I should find out more about him. So then I had to turn back to read the book, because I hadn't read it in a while, only to discover that he didn't even exist. This man wasn't ever a human being. Their priest was the one who booked them at all the churches where they sang and they became successful. But the movie writers and the play writers didn't think that audiences would understand that a priest could also function in that fashion, right? They would not be able to split the character like that. So they invented this crazy Max guy, and he was very funny, and obviously he's stuck with me. But how interesting, he doesn't even exist. So that's when I realized, oh, when they take a book or a play and they make a movie out of it, they don't actually just copy what was already done. Oh, that's kind of annoying, but now it means I really have to focus on the actual piece of literature first. So, when I started thinking about what to do here, I thought, well, what do writers have to say about adaptations? And one of my favorite early American writers is Theodore Dreiser. He wrote a book called American Tragedy. And when they were discussing the idea, early days of film, obviously, because we're black and white, aren't we? This is Joseph von Sternberg. And he uh, was talking to Dreiser, and this was his particular quote, literature cannot be transferred to the screen without loss to its values. The visual elements completely revalue the written words. I don't know that I believe that, but in the early days of film, they weren't sure. Was the film, was the visual going to overwhelm the words? And actually, my joke is, I don't have a slide for this, but my joke is that one of my favorite adaptations of A Christmas Carol is the one the Muppets did. Because in the Muppet version, they let one of the Muppets read all the narration that would normally never show up because it's not dialogue. And so you hear Dickens' words, and you're like, oh, that's so cool, right? So um, you have to consider that. So Dreiser was worried about that. Now, in his career, his book, American Tragedy, was made into a film twice. In 1931, Sternberg actually um, directed it, and this is the book. But in 1951, it became this, A Place in the Sun, which is hugely famous, both as an adaptation and as an Elizabeth Taylor movie with Montgomery Clift and Shelley Winters, long before she was a little old woman that everybody laughed at. Um, and this was a marvelous story based in a true life event, then fictionalized for the novel, then the novel further adapted into the film because it dealt with some issues that we couldn't talk about in film even in the early 1950s. 
basically, Montgomery Cliff's character is a very poor young man who moves to the big city, gets a job with his distant cousin's factory, and he's told you can't date the factory workers. So he actually has an under, nobody knows relationship with a woman who works with him, and that's Shelley Winters. Meanwhile, he's getting to know his cousin's very rich family that includes their neighbor, Elizabeth Taylor. And of course he falls in love with her, but no one's ever gonna let them get married because he's the poor boy and she's the rich girl. But he starts getting promoted and making more money and they're like, ah. Meanwhile, Shelley Winters, the girlfriend, yeah, you know what happens to her? She gets pregnant. And when she tells him, it's, oh no, gonna ruin his life. So he has to figure out what to do. And the really scary, sad thing, which comes from the true life story, is that he took her out on a rowboat for a date and he killed her and dumped her in the river because he wants to marry the rich girl, right? This was very, very controversial for back in the day, right? But they were able to get away with it. So Dreiser shouldn't have worried about his work because it transferred pretty well to the screen, right? I think one of the most interesting adaptations is a book we really don't teach in film classes anymore, and we shouldn't because the content is awful. We don't need this story anymore, but it's an interesting demonstration in why the power of adaptations, right? Of course, I'm talking about The Klansman, which was written just after the Civil War and has to do with the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. And it makes the Ku Klux Klan the heroes, which is frightening. I know, <laughs> eyebrow riff up there. How could that possibly be true? Well, obviously, a former Confederate, the children of Confederates, would think of them as heroes. So this was a huge book, right? And sadly, one of the early, early uh, directors that we all know, D.W. Griffith, was also in love with the Confederacy in the South. His grandfather had been in the Confederate Army. So he undertook to make the film, which was huge. It starts out being called Klansman, but we know it now more as the birth of a nation. Again, we used to teach it in film classes because there's a lot of new camera angles and things that make it valuable, but we've come away from that because the content is just so controversial and so valueless that we don't teach it in classes anymore. What I wanted to mention about it is a couple of things. First of all, yeah, it's very incendiary, right? And the scary thing is, this is a quote from President Woodrow Wilson in his own history of the United States. So first of all, hmm, all right, that's a little scary. But because of the material, thank goodness, the NAACP protested when this film opened. It didn't stop people from seeing it, sadly. And in fact, Wilson showed it at the White House. And the power of movies, he actually said, it is like capturing lightning in a bottle. And he was very impressed with the power that movies had from watching that particular film, which is kind of sad. Now, what strikes me as interesting is the power of how you change a story and you change culture. We all know, sadly, that what the Ku Klux Klan does is they burn crosses in people's yards when they don't like them. They didn't do that before this movie came out. The actual Ku Klux Klan did not do that, right? In the novel, what, uh, what they have happen is that when the men get together to go do a terrible, you know, lynching, they write the names of their families on little wooden crosses they've made, and they toss them into a big bonfire. And that shows the unity of all these men together. And this is apparently based on a Scottish ritual that Scottish clans will do when they come together for events, not for killing people, but for regular events. So we adapt a Scottish ritual into an idea in the book. D.W. Griffith gets a hold of it, and he's the Steven Spielberg of his day, right? We cannot have little tiny crosses being thrown into a big fire on screen. No, we're going to make a big cross on the mountainside. Isn't that wonderful? That's so visual. Oh, that's a great special effect. The actual Ku Klux Klansmen go to the movie, see the giant cross, and begin burning giant crosses in people's neighborhoods. They actually learn from the movie a ritual that wasn't theirs to begin with. So I find that really fascinating, and I think it's a sign of how powerful what we see in the movies can be, and we need to pay attention to that. So thankfully, like I said, we don't teach that movie anymore. Now, in this early period of films, right out of the sound, uh, right out of the silent era, what makes us change novels? What's the, one of the biggest reasons? Well, it's the Hayes Code. And the Hayes Code was put together because there was a fear that in silent movies, there was a lot of nudity. <gasps> and women were getting divorced helter-skelter and having sex with men whenever they wanted. It was very... And the idea was films were art and there are naked pictures at the museum, so shouldn't there be naked people in the movies? It should be okay, right? But many groups got together and were very worried about it. 
they were going to ask the government, they were asking the government to come up with a list of things that shouldn't happen in movies. And the movie companies were like, no, 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 you'll destroy us if we have to follow your rules. We'll create our own office and we'll make up the rules that we can follow. And the government let them do that and that became the Hayes Code, right? And this Hayes Code, these are the things you could not show in films. And this is going to go all the way up till 1968. And it's a pretty good list, so these are the many things that you can think about that weren't shown. Right? Misogynation is an interracial r romance that was disallowed for all this time. Um, notice you'll remember from your early days of watching the I Love Lucy show, married couples, twin beds, that went all the way through television. The Brady Bunch, the two, Carol and, uh, what's his name? Uh, I can't remember Mr. Brady's first name. Hmm? Mr. Brady. Mr. Brady, I care. They were the first couple on television to sleep in the same bed to be seen having a double bed in their living room, right? That's hilarious. So all of these things are rules that now we have to apply to the novels we buy, say whether or not we can show those things. And I'm particularly going to look at number four, sex perversion, which is just their code for homosexuality, which they weren't going to allow on screen. So this is going to force changes in a couple of very, very important pieces of business. Breakfast at Tiffany's, which is a gorgeous movie and a gorgeous novel. And it's a nice little slim novel. People should read it over the weekend. It's brilliant. <laughs> um, all right, so, of course, written by Truman Capote, who was at that time an out-of-the-closet homosexual. And that was just a shocking thing. Nobody quite understood what that meant. Um, and nobody was sure they liked it. But Breakfast at Tiffany's. Most people remember this as the brilliant... Uh, performance by Audrey Hepburn, which it was, right? Became the film with her, and notice she's the thing we focus on in this thing. Really, it's not just her story, though. This is the story of this young woman unexplainably in the city making money because she's friendly with a lot of rich men. But we're not going to really discuss what that friendship entails, right? So we don't say what she does for a living. She just always has rich men hanging around her. So we'll just kind of slide that under the rug. But more importantly, change-wise, we have George Papard, who some of you will remember in childhood as part of the A-team. <laughs> but he's a huge movie star in this period. He's a leading man, and he's a writer in this piece. He really stands in for Truman Capote. This is really a story about Truman Capote's first time in New York and getting his first novel sold. So George Papard in the movie, this is a love story. And they fall in love with each other in the end, even though she's a free spirit, she's never going to fall in love with anybody, she doesn't want to be tied down by a man. Becomes a lovely romance. By the time we're done, the cat is a symbol of how she won't commit because she never names her cat. And at the very end of the movie, to prove she doesn't need anybody, she dumps the cat out of a taxi in the rain, and it goes sauntering off and gets all soaking wet. And the proof that she's changed and grown is that she jumps out of the taxi and chases down the cat. And she saves it. We're like, oh, and then she names the cat. And we're like, okay, she's grown, she's changed. What a beautiful love story. There's a small problem with that adaptation. Even Truman Capote himself said, the only thing they took from my book was the title. The characters exist. Right? They are true. However, in real life, George Papard's character, Truman Capote, in the book, the character's gay. That's why the two of them never end up together. It's not a love story. It's a friendship. It's a buddy story between a gay man and a woman. Right? This is Will and Grace before there was Will and Grace. Problem is, they couldn't do that on screen. So how can we show he's doing something wrong sexually that isn't being a homosexual? Oh. He's a gigolo. Just like she makes her money from rich men, he makes his money from a rich woman who keeps him and buys him suits. And that's the perversion that he's allowed to have on screen. And it's with Patricia Neal, famous actress back in the day. And I always thought that was so sad because they make her out to be this little old lady. She's not that much older than he is, actually, at this moment. So that's kind of funny. But um, so that's a huge change, and, and to uh, Truman Capote, a huge loss in his particular story. The one they adapted much better is In Cold Blood, which is one of those books, if I start reading the first page, I have to shut up and go read the rest of the book. <laughs> it's quite a brilliant book, and this one they followed almost to the letter. I mean, obviously you can't include everything in an adaptation, but they didn't make any real changes because the story was so well known, and it was based on a true serial murder. So he was happy with that, and he actually got very involved in the actors of that. He hated this movie. Now, what I love about using Patricia Neal is she leads us into Roald Dahl, because she's married to him. Most people, not everybody knows she was married to Roald Dahl, who gave us <gasps> Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which some people did read as children, or perhaps they didn't read it. They instead saw, from the book, Willy Wonka. 
And notice how that changed? It's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. The movie is Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. We've entirely changed the focus of who is the important character in this book. And if you saw that as a child, you remember that we fell in love with Gene Wilder. This book, anybody who's read this book? Not a soft, fuzzy little children's book at all, right? Because that's not what Roald Dahl did. But at the time this movie was made, in the early 70s, that's what we're looking for. Nice families, good kids, everything's safe. It's all going to be fine in the end. It takes Tim Burton to come back and finally use the real story in the book and make a film that is much more um, honest and loyally covering the story. Problem is, it's not as popular because we fell in love with the softer, milder, gentle version of it. And so people who liked that film did not find themselves liking the film that is actually much more based on the real book. So that's a trap. If you allow your book to be adapted, it's going to grow and change. And you might not appreciate where it goes, whether you're Truman Capote or Roald Dahl. I always think that's really interesting. I didn't like this version. <laughs> I like Johnny Depp. I saw it. My kids saw it. I, didn't, I have a copy of the Gene Wilder DVD, and we keep playing that one. That, that works for me. So this is a piece becomes a new thing when it becomes a film. And writers have to be able to let it go. So I thought that was pretty funny. Now, going back to how the Hayes Code affected things, same thing's going to happen to this famous Tennessee Williams play, Cat on a Hot Tin Rough. When this play is on Broadway, it's about a rich southern family, and the father's going to die. And he's going to let one of his two sons inherit all his wealth. And he prefers his older son, who's played by Paul Newman in the movie. Um, but this son has something wrong with him. He used to play football. And his football buddy just committed suicide. So he's really, really depressed. And we never really get around to saying in the movie why he's so depressed. And his wife keeps trying to have sex with him. But he doesn't want to. And they know if they have a baby, the father will prefer giving them the money because he wants the money to stay in the family, right? So she's desperate to have sex with Paul Newman because who isn't really in the long run? Um, and he's not having anything to do with it. In the movie, we keep talking about how depressed he is because his friend committed suicide. In the play, we're told the friend committed suicide because Paul Newman turned him down. They're gay. And he's only married to Maggie, his wife, for the look of things. Right? So again, we're going to hide a homosexual storyline, yet this is such a really, really sexualized movie. It's quite fascinating. Now, you know, speaking of that, I mean, it, it's Paul Newman, so you can't go wrong with a little quick slide of Paul Newman looking good. Um, and just for, for all you little people in here, you do know he's the voice of Doc Hudson. I always think that's important to understand where these folks come from. So, Cat on the Hunting Roof, Breakfast at Tiffany's, both victims of the Hayes Code, which is going to stay in place for a long time. Gidget in the 50s is a different story. And I think this one is really sad. When you think of Gidget, if you think of anything, you think of fluffy girl hanging out at the beach, cutesy, cutesy, cutesy. The crazy thing is when this book was first written, there's an actual woman who is actually the maitre d' at Duke's in Malibu right now in her 70s. And she is Gidget. Gidget is merely a nickname. It means girl midget, so short girl or petite girl. And in her real life, she grew up her dad, Frederick Koner, was a writer of early 50s television shows, lived in, in Hollywood, and she would go to the beach every day. And in a world where we overprotect our children today, I can't even fathom that at 16 she would get in the family convertible, drive to the beach, stay all day without a cell phone or a check-in time or any information, hang out with a bunch of 20-something surf dudes, and learn how to surf in the ocean with no parent watching her. But that was her actual life. And the book is about how she strove to become as good a surfer as these men did, so that they would accept her not as a cute chick, but as a surfer. And that's not the story people remember if they saw the movies. When this book came out, it was compared to The Catcher in the Rye. It was considered that kind of novel for girls. It was the coming of the age. She decides whether or not to have sex with a couple of the guys. It's entirely up to her. There's really nothing wrong with it. It's a fascinating story that has been totally destroyed by the way, it was turned into a film. And it became a bubblegum film about a cute girl on the beach with cute boys. Totally, totally cut the knees off of that book, right? And she went Hawaiian, she went to Rome. I mean, it just became this cutesy pie girl trying to, trying to find a boyfriend. Not the point of the novel at all. 
So the movies completely destroyed it to the point that we don't teach Gidget in school, but you all probably had to read Catcher in the Rye. Everybody, right? We read the boys' coming-of-age story. We don't read the girls' coming-of-age story. And I think that's a huge mistake. I didn't read Gidget till I was in my 40s. And I went, wow, this is like a cool book. I don't know why anyone didn't give it to me, right? And it was worse when it went to television, which is another level of adaptation. We're going to take a movie. We're going to put it on TV where we can do even less because we're not in the movies. And in this case, just look at how once we bring Sally Field into the picture, it gets even younger and there's not a surfboard in sight. This entire book is about a girl who masters a sport. On TV, it's about a girl who talks on the phone and hangs out with cute boys. That's an entire destruction of the point of that story. And it was written by the father of the girl who had achieved that. So he was looking to make his daughter a respectable, interesting person. So I think that's an excellent example of something being ruined. Only in the book do you get the true story of what it was like. So again, I always go back to, you have to read the book. Now, the Hayes Code stayed with us until 1968. Finally, we let it go, and it was replaced by the motion picture film rating system that we're all used to today, right? So your G, your PG, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of my favorite funny stories is that an R rating, and there's listings of everything you have to do to see what rating you earn. The R rating can be earned if you use the F word more than once in consecutive conversation. So the King's Speech, which won the Oscar a couple of years ago, was originally released with an R rating. Because when he's stuttering, he says the F word four or five times in a row in one sentence. That's entirely, nobody has sex in that movie. Nobody does anything that, it's a G-rated movie. It entirely is, except for that moment. So once it won the Oscar, they cut that one piece out, and they re-released it as a PG film. Because then they knew families wanted to come see it. I think that's hilarious. So there are rules that come off of the Hayes Code, but that are, work in our film system now, but they're not as bad as the Hayes Code was. So this is one of the things that changed many of our films. Now what we have to discover is what rating do you want, right? Really, people don't want a G rating because they think teenagers won't come to it. So they have to have a couple of bad words. So for instance, E.T., he calls his brother penis breath. That gives him a PG. That one moment. And they entirely did that merely to make sure they could get so teenagers would go see that movie. It's really quite hilarious. I mean, it's calculated. It has to be planned ahead. And likewise, sometimes they'll do just a couple of extra things to nudge themselves into an R rating, and then they'll fight with the board, and then say, okay, we'll take these two things out, and it's the other stuff they really wanted to keep. But they had to put those extra things in there so they could be seen to compromise in order to pull down to a PG rating. It's just ridiculous. But this is a huge change in terms of what we can do in movies. That doesn't mean we stop having pressure to change particular movies. And this one is probably my all-time favorite movie in the whole history of the world, The Godfather, which I always make film students watch if they haven't because it's quite brilliant. But as a kid, I snuck a copy of this and read it when I wasn't supposed to. It was in the, in the adult section of the library, and so I had a friend sneak it out. Instead of going to a liquor store and getting liquor, I got The Godfather so that I could read it and figure out, because I would seen the movie and I really wanted to know more about it. Now, in the movie, as we all know, Marlon Brando is going to play Vito Corleone. And it is a pretty good version of the book, but there are things they can't do. The first thing is they had great trouble, not with any film rating system, despite the violence that will appear in this film. Violence, not so bad. It's the sex and the bad words we don't like children to see. Violence, they can see all kinds of, right? Here's what changed. In the book, they mentioned the word mafia a couple of times. In the adaptation, originally the script, they did as well, because that was the word people understood. The Italian-American Civil Rights League, which really exists, <laughs> um, they demanded that that word not be used, or they would protest the existence of the film. And they were not giantly powerful. They're not really the NAACP here, but you know, they were kind of loudmouth Italians, and they really wanted things done their way. Um, what's funny about them is Joe Colombo was the uh, founder of the Italian-American Civil Rights League, and, and he's a mafia leader who ended up in jail and became a state's witness, and he's like a true mafiosi, and he was insisting the mafia didn't exist, and so they couldn't use that word in the movie. What was crazy was he wasn't smart enough to ask to read a copy of the script. He didn't know they would let him do that, so he just demanded they never use the word, and it turned out they'd only used it twice in the whole original script. So they were perfectly happy to say, okay, we won't use it. You can't say La Cosa Nostra, you can't say mafia. So they just keep saying this thing of ours. Didn't hurt the movie, but it was something that stressed 
it might have had a financial bearing on it because they figured the Italian audience is who's going to come see this movie. Now, what really changes in most adaptations is the books are too long to be turned into films. And so The Godfather provides us a good example of something that had to change both for length and for sexual content. In the book, right, in, in the beginning of the movie, you see Sonny on the day of his sister's wedding, and he's banging the maid of honor up against the wall in the bathroom, right? That's how we were introduced to the character of Sonny. They never really told us what was going on. It went by pretty quick, so little kids might not have noticed, so they got away with that. Mm, all right, he's married, and he's having sex with somebody he's not married with. Mm, okay. And then it just drops. We never hear anything more about that storyline. In truth, in the book, Lucy Mancini, who is the bride, the bridesmaid, is one of the high-level characters. She actually is still his mistress through the course of his life until he's blown up in the toll booth. And then the family pays her a pension because she's been their son's companion. So just like his wife gets his legal inheritance, the family pays her money basically because she lost her second husband, if you will. Um, but what really is interesting about her storyline is they move her to Las Vegas when they're going to start getting embedded in Vegas. And when they want to run a casino, they need someone whose name can go on the liquor license who doesn't have a criminal past. So she becomes that person for them at the casino. So she moves up in management as a woman in the 60s and early 70s who's doing this high-level job, which shocks everybody. Um, and she's lonely because she misses Sonny. And along the way, she falls in love with Jules Siegel, who's a Jewish doctor who used to work in New York but got busted by the cops for providing abortions. This is before Roe versus Wade, so it's illegal. So Michael Corleone saves him from his legal tanglement by moving him to Vegas, making him the doctor at the casino to take care of rich women who have problems that come to Vegas to take care of that we don't discuss. And then he falls in love with Lucy, and they have this whole little relationship, and there's a whole little discussion about how big penises are and whether or not they're useful and what's wrong with her and there's an operation and it's very it's very sexual it's not something that was ever going to make it in the movie right for two reasons the sexual content and it's a minor character compared to the family of the Corleone so we have to get rid of somebody right so we lose Lucy she's a really interesting story though I remember really really be into that of course I didn't quite understand everything they were telling me when I was 10 but oh well now the Godfather leads us to The Outsiders, which was also done by Francis Ford Coppola. And that's because this is probably, along with In Cold Blood, one of the most faithful adaptations of a novel ever into a film. And that's because, and I love this too, because it's the power of the audience. A group of fourth graders who loved The Godfather, I don't know how they quite saw it, but they understood that Francis Ford Coppola was a very important director. They sent him a copy of The Outsiders with a note asking him to direct the movie version. And he was like, well, I never even heard of this book. I suppose I'll read it. He read it. He thought, wow, this is pretty good. I can do that. And he made sure, because of what the children had written him, he made sure to be as faithful to that book as he could. So if you watch that movie with a novel in your hand, nothing happens that doesn't happen in the novel. And he uses almost everything in the novel. There's nothing that gets left behind. Now, it's a small, it's a slim little novel, but it's an amazing piece of adaptation. It is a perfect copy of that novel. And it's funny because people dismiss it because it's a, you know, a teen book or a preteen book at this stage, but it's really, really an excellent example of how to do an adaptation properly. So the audiences for this are hugely popular, hugely happy. And of course, this is the cast who are many, many famous actors, um, which is pretty cool. Good bit. All right, now, here's one of the most controversial adaptations over the last 15 years. Pat Conroy and the Prince of Tides, which was purchased by Barbara Streisand's company to be made into a film. People who read Conroy's stuff, and particularly this novel, they were so in love with this book. And I must say, I read it after I saw the movie. So it was a very unique experience. Had I read it first, I might have been on their side and angry with how the movie came out. But I didn't, so I didn't understand, right? And the movie, I thought, was quite well done. It got many Oscar nominations and whatnot. The story here is about a Southern family. Um, Tom Wingo is our lead character, the sister Savannah, the brother Luke, who's committed suicide in the course of the novel, and this therapist, Susan Lowenstein, who's played by Barbara Streisand, who also directed the film. So in the book, we have the family and the, the therapist. And the therapist is working with the, the girl, Savannah, because she's tried to commit suicide. And so we have to understand why, and it all traces back to this dark day in the family where this awful thing happened and the mother covered it up. 
that all takes place in New York City because that's where the therapist lives and that's where the girl has gone. When we turn it into a movie, Barbra Streisand and the, you know, the staff completely took out the second brother. He's already dead when the book starts. Instead of flashbacking to him, she just said, never mind, we don't care. And the title of the book, The Prince of Tides, is Luke Wingo. By kicking him out of the story, she turns that into being Tom, the main character. So many people who adored the book and adored this character of Luke were angry because not only did she erase him, but they reconfigured where his nickname went. That's a huge change from the original mention in the book, right? But it tightened the movie because the movie in the end is a love story between the guy and the therapist. That is part of the novel, but not the focus of the novel. So here she's going to star in the thing. She's going to play the therapist. Guess who's going to be the more important character? Sorry, you want Barbara Streisand to make your movie, that's what you're going to get. I think it's a really good movie, and I and we got Oscar nominations. I just don't think in this case you want to know about the book. <laughs> now, I read the book afterwards, and because I was so interested in the Tom Wingo character, I was bored with the Luke character. That didn't work for me. I thought, oh, I wish I would read it first so I could have made that comparison. But it's an interesting look at how big a change you could make and still essentially create a successful storyline having to do with major characters that were invented. So that was a huge controversy. Now, we all know that recently there's been a whole run of Jane Austen. Suddenly the whole world loves Jane Austen again, which is fine. Um, recently, well, not that recently, Sense and Sensibility was turned into a movie. Hugely successful, the best adaptation of this particular story ever. It was written by... Emma Thompson, who some people forget, is also a writer, not just an actress. Um, and she was hired because they wanted a writer who would retain the humor in Jane Austen. Many people don't think she has humor, right? And in fact, she does. So um, Emma Thompson was a famous comedian at the time. It was long before she did any work in America with Kenneth Branagh. So she was just known as a comedian in England. She took on the job. It took them about five or six years to get it made. What's really interesting is she kept a diary of the process of adapting it and then the process of filming the adaptation, wherein continued changes were made on a daily basis on the set. So she documents changes, why they were made, who asked for them, whether she agreed or not, how that discussion took place. It's a really excellent look at the full process of adapting something, and it became quite, um, quite a financial success. So it was a pretty big, um, pretty big adaptation to know of. Now Argo, which of course won the Oscar just a couple of years ago, is an example of some changes that were made that are regrettable. And yet the movie holds up. Um, and it's not Ben Affleck's fault, all right? When Ben Affleck went to make the movie, which won an Oscar for him, he knew that in the story, which is a true story, the actual CIA gentleman is named Tony Mendez. Tony Mendez. Ben Affleck doesn't look like a Tony Mendez. He wanted a Latino actor to be the lead in the film. He looked for someone that the studio would approve. The only Latino actor one considers can open a movie is Antonio Banderas. And he's booked, 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 because he's the only Latino actor who can open a movie. So the studio said to Affleck, look, why don't you play the part? He said, but I'm not Latino. It's going to erase the ethnic feeling of this movie. And they said, well, then we just won't make the movie. He said, okay, as long as we keep the guy's name, maybe people will realize, and of course, if they look at the book, they will understand that they're talking about a Hispanic character. So that was one change. Um, and that change happens a lot in movies, and that's regrettable because people need to be represented. We need to understand that we're in a multicultural, diverse country. And every time we take a character who has some ethnic background, I mean, imagine Vito Corleone. Actually, when they went to make The Godfather, one of the people up for playing Michael Corleone was Robert Redford. As an Italian? How is that going to work, right? But he was a big name, and he was young, and whatever. So, so that was one change that Affleck was forced to make, or the movie wouldn't have been made at all, which I think is interesting. He thought the story was worth getting out there. The other change has to do with the script. If you've seen the movie, of course, it's about saving these American embassy officials who were hiding out at the Canadian embassy during the Iranian hostage crisis. He creates this lovely, and it all is true, he, he made them up to be a film crew from Canada, and they were going to walk right to the airport, get on a plane, and go home. In the real world, the tension that happened at the very end of the story happened inside the airport. And it was because all of these embassy officials were made up to be stereotypical Hollywood people. So the man who was one of the leading 
officials, who was a very straight-laced guy, would always show up in a suit and a tie and all that. He was doing the Hollywood director bling thing with the chest hair and the gold necklace, and he's sitting at this airport, a woman from another embassy who recognized him because she'd worked with him previously, begins to approach him at the airport to say hi. And of course, she's got this look on her face like, why is he dressed up like this strange man? Is this Halloween or what? And he's sitting across the... Because they were afraid people would see who he was. So the woman didn't approach him. They all got on the plane. They all were safe. That moment of tension is what the screenwriter and what Affleck wanted to capture. But that is not very engaging, walking across an airport looking at a guy in an outfit. That's not going to work. So they invented this huge chase on the tarmac where the cars come chasing after the plane. We all know the cars will never catch the plane. It's kind of stupid. But in their defense, it provided the audience with that last minute feeling of tension that was true to the feelings that the hostages had even on the plane. Until they took off and were in the air, they still felt it was possible they would be captured, recaptured. So I think that's an interesting choice. They, of course, knew it was the big climactic moment in the movie. They needed a big visual. What's better than a car chase on a tarmac? So people have to read the book to understand what was and wasn't part of this operation. There's so much inside the book as well. He talks about previous uh, uh, affairs that he was involved in. It's fascinating what this man could do. And to not go and get that extra information is a loss because this movie opens up a story that it can't possibly give us the rest of. So I think that's a good example. Of course, we all know, gee whiz, the biggest adaptation over the last 10 years has been the whole set of Tolkien books. I'm just going to look at The Hobbit for a minute because When it became a movie, they invented an entire character who doesn't appear in the book at all. Just made her up because there weren't enough chicks involved in this story, right? They thought, oh, no, we need to do something about that. So Toriel doesn't exist in the books, right? But they wanted to have a little bit of a love story. They wanted to have a female character, largely because one of the more popular female characters in the Lord of the Rings adaptation is Ewan, right? Everybody thinks, well, that's Toriel, excuse me. And that's, she's so important, you got on one of the posters. Is Ewan, right? And she stood out in the whole Lord of the Rings saga because of what line? <laughs> I am no man. Wham! What a great moment, right? That's the moment. Every... So they knew in making The Hobbit a film, they had to have some sort of female character who could bring that to the new production. So they invented lots of true Tolkien fans deeply angered that such a thing should happen and there should be focus on a character when other stuff was being thrown out. This is a choice of screenwriters and directors as they try to decide to bring something to film. The Hobbit had been made in animation several years earlier, 1977. It's only 77 minutes long. So would you rather have that version or the new version with an extra elf that doesn't really exist? Now make up your mind, right? What I love about this is it was made by Rankin and Bass, the same company that gave us Rudolph the red Nose Ring who himself was an adaptation of a song. A song turned into a beloved Christmas story, right? So uh, you could adapt from anything. Um, All right. Now, of course, I mentioned that we would talk about Harry Potter briefly. We could be here for a whole hour, two, three, six, talking about all the Harry Potter adaptations. What I think is important to notice is, of course, as you know, The book in England was called Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. When it came to be published in America, they were afraid American children would look at the word philosopher and walk away because that's old and boring. That's for old people. So, of course, in America, what do we call it? The Sorcerer's Stone, because the sorcerer is kind of cool. It's Mickey with the hat, so we like sorcerers. We're good. So, I mean, that's, that's an adaptation made by, by, by our, our publication people just to sell more books, right? But this is a huge thing to adapt. And what I think is fascinating is this guy over here, Steve Close, he did six of the seven Harry Potter movies. He actually quit after the third movie. He's like, well, I have to go focus on my own work. And his son said, his son was 10 years old. He said, Dad, there's no cachet in being the son of the guy who used to write the Harry Potter movies. So he took on the next one and he did all the rest of them and created great friendship with J.K. Rowling to the point where they could talk often about things she hadn't released yet. He was privy to new things coming up in books that had yet to be published, and it was a very deeply secret, you can't tell anybody, blah, 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 really kind of fascinating. But to study the work they did, and one of the great things that he said in several interviews was that he had to look at these giant books and think of the theme 
which is what we teach people in the writing films. It's all about theme, right? Start with a theme, and any storyline that's tangential to that theme has to be thrown away. We can't waste our time on it, right? So when we come around to Harry Potter coming of age, that's the same book that has all the elf stuff going on with Hermione, and she's going to unionize the elves and all that stuff. It doesn't appear in the movie at all, because that has nothing to do with Harry Potter and his growing. So that storyline disappears. So it's an interesting choice. It's a difficult choice. It's why they, in the end, chose to split the last book in two, not just to make a lot more money, because they did, but because they didn't want to throw too much away. And they had gained enough power and enough cachet at that point that they could do that. So it's one of the more um, successful adaptations, really, of all time. And in contrast, little tiny things change. Like, for instance, you have to remember, you have to read the books again. When it's time to get the gillyweed, in the movie, it gets given to him by Neville, because we have to keep the Neville character alive. In the book, Dobby gives it to him. But Dobby is, we can't waste time on him. He's also, he costs money to put on screen because he's all fake, right? <laughs> so little changes like that along the way. And generally, fans weren't too upset because they understood the reasons for it. We're much more savvy, right? We read magazines about this stuff. We see all kinds of online work about what's happening with our favorite movies and books. So we're much more savvy than people used to be. Now, the excellent work adapting Harry Potter was tossed away when they adapted the Rick Reardon series that my son loved, Percy Jackson. Love these books, and in many ways, they're rip-offs of Harry Potter. They just really are, I'm sorry. Kid finds out he's a Greek god instead of a wizard. What's the difference, all right? I'm gonna be powerful and save the world. Problem is, when they went to make these in movies, they didn't trust the source material, right? In the uh, film version, this boy is 17. In the book, he's 12. The things that a child can say to his parents at 12 sound ridiculous and whiny if a 17-year-old says them. So they destroyed the support for that character by making him older, and they only did that so that his best friend, his Hermione in the books, can actually be the hot chick he has uh, he wants to have a relationship with in the older books. So we don't care about 12-year-olds having, we want the 16-year-old to have a girlfriend. So because of simply changing his age by a few years, they totally tweaked how the book turned into a film, and it failed miserably. They were going to make all five films, they only ended up making two, which is really kind of amazing when you think about it, because this came after Harry Potter. They'd had a lesson in how to do it properly and they ignored every single moment, which shocks me desperately. Um, hey, guess what's in the theaters right now that's an adaptation? We have the Steve Jobs film, which comes originally from the book by Walter Isaacson, being made into the film now, which just opened. Aaron Sorkin is the screenwriter here, and Aaron Sorkin fully admits in all interviews, I want you to get the feel of his life, not the facts of his life. So he made up a bunch of stuff and added it to the movie because he thought it made a more interesting scene. It doesn't even come from the book. It's things he imagined maybe Jobs might have done when he was visiting with friends or having a private conversation with his daughter. And Sorkin fully admits that he was interested in studying the relationship between the father and the daughter because in his own life, he has a dysfunctional relationship with his daughter. And so in a couple of interviews I just heard recently on NPR, he came out and said, I really just wrote a movie about me and my daughter, and I threw Steve Jobs' name on it. That's how far from the book he has taken that particular story. So I think that's really interesting. Now, the latest latest is The Martian, which is a really interesting book on several levels. You guys know it was self-published, and he would put chapters online one chapter at a time, and he would take input from people, and then he would add that to the stuff he was writing as he went further. And he got so much of a following online, he was able to take it to publishing companies, and they said, wow, if that many people care about what's happening, we'll try publishing it. It became a bestseller. Now, of course, it's become a movie with Matt Damon, hugely successful the last two, three weeks at the box office. It's been the number one movie. What have they changed? Well, happily, not too much. In the book, they jump right into him being there. You know, in the movie, they have to show you how stuff exploded, so it's big and exciting, and that's why we know he's stuck on Mars. That's a small change. No one's too upset. What bothers me is we have another Argo situation. There's a character in the book named Mindy Park, and she is his connection down at NASA, right? If I say the last name Park to you, does any ethnicity come to your mind? Korean-American. Korean That's who she is in the book. In the movie, can't get much blonder than that. <laughs> Absolutely every bit of ethnicity has been washed out of that character which is amazing because clearly it's a very successful and popular character inside the novel. Why they didn't think that they could allow a Korean-American actress to portray her is kind of fascinating. 
but also kind of sad, because if you don't read the book, you don't really get the story, right? And so, frankly, the moral of the story, which I thought was hilarious, there's actually a book called The Moral of the Story. <laughs> the moral of the story is, you got to read the books. You can't just see the movies, you have to read the books, so you're not really having the experience that the person wanted you to have. And I think that's the coolest thing, because it lets the movie continue to live with you. If you liked it that much, you're going to love the extra details you get inside the book. That's it. Thank you very much. Mm. Yay.